Okay, welcome everyone to um, session two of the Speed Talk presentations. Um, just to note that there's going to be a slight change to what you see in the program. You'll see the program allocated eight minutes per presentation. What between the two sessions, we're going to stick to the original allocation of five minutes. So the speakers will have three minutes for presentations and two minutes for questions. Although I'll notify each of the speakers at four minutes that they've got a minute left. So we'll be running slightly ahead of the program, but you'll be able to swap between sessions and they should stay on time. We're going to try and stick to that time. And then there'll be a little bit of extra time with us running ahead where you can ask additional questions, maybe that we didn't have time to give to the presenters or which come up later for you as we go. So let's start off with the first speaker, which is Reshni Lala. Thank you, Reshni. Thanks. Can you let me know if it's on, uh, you can see the slides? Yes, see it. Thanks, Rajni. Hello? Are the slides visible on your end? Yes, they're visible. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Ever wanted to play your part in the fight against invasive alien plants, but wasn't quite sure how? Well, here's your chance. You can assist us at Sandby by looking out for the two alien plants featured in this talk and reporting populations by using the email address at the end. Both alien plants are currently not listed on the member invasive regulations, but are being assessed by us as potential invasive species. Take note of the diagnostic features coming up. The first plant is Alstomeria citicina, commonly called princess lily or Inca lily. In field, you will be looking for an herbaceous plant less than a meter tall and crowned with funnel shaped flowers. It is these flowers that are probably the most diagnostic feature of the plant because they range in a variety of different colors from red to orange to purple. And they can also be flecked, striped, striped or brown spots as we can see in this image. The seed pods are also held erect above the plant. So they are also quite diagnostic in field. The leaves are arranged in a whorl around the stem and they are also spoon shaped with a bit of a twisted uh, petiole. If you were to dig underneath, you will find an extensive rhizome system and tubers. And this is how this species survives and persists during unfavorable conditions. This is the end of plant one. Plant two is a cactus. Brazilio Puntia brasiliensis is one of the tallest members of the Cactaceae family. It can grow to heights of up to 10 meters, and it has a very tree-like appearance with an erect trunk. The cladodes are flattened and droopy, although rigid, and the fruit are in the shape of sweet bell peppers, uh, and they turn a dark red when mature. The trunk has many branches like a tree and it's also armed with hectic sharp red to brown um, spines which you, you will not miss in field. Lastly the flowers are smallish and lime yellow in color. In summary if you were to spot either of these two alien plants anywhere in the country please email invasive species at sandby dot org dot za thank you thanks Rosny. um any questions please feel free to post any questions i didn't say that at the beginning in the question and answer tab i see lots of claps thanks Rosny. maybe just one question we might come back for more questions why in particular these two species why did they come up as flagged on your side? Yeah, both of them are currently unlisted. Normally we go with the category 1A species and NEMBA um, as emerging invasive alien species. That's usually the target of our program. But we also look at unlisted species. Sometimes it's um, brought to us by the public reporting something that's suspicious growing in their backyard or along a river or something like that. But in these two cases, uh, we also work with other stakeholders who know our focus and they also report um, suspicious plants to us. So that's the case with both of them. 
Okay, great. Yeah, they're just showing initial signs of invasiveness or naturalizing or growing in places where they're not supposed to be and they don't belong. So they are very suspicious and we, we focus on them and learn more about them and see what they're actually doing in the country right. before we de can declare them as fully invasive. Sure. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just take one question. We'll come back. I think there's going to be a gap later on, but from Anina asking, do you want reports from wild plants only or from garden areas as well? I think at this stage, because both of the projects are very uh, initial, so we want as much information as possible. So we'll take uh, populations gardens as well, because we want to understand the full story of these species in South Africa. So thanks. Great. Great. Thanks, Reshni. Sure. Um, okay, so if we'll open up to the next speaker, which is Karabu Malloy. Karabu? Hi. Let me just share my screen. It's not yet sharing, Karabu. It's not sharing. No, we just see your camera. Okay. Karabu, did you pre open your presentation in full slideshow? Uh, yes. Okay, then remember. To Windows D. Okay. Okay. Click on the Google I uh, Chrome icon button. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then go share. In Rima, click on share at the bottom of your screen. I clicked on share. Okay. Okay. Then choose window at the at the top. Mm hmm. Because it will say entire screen window Chrome tab. Click window, and then yeah, click I on see the entire screen. But then when I sh when I click on window, it's giving me a blank screen. Okay, just close your presentation and open it again. No, I'm not winning. <laughs> okay. Um, have you shared that with us? No, I hadn't. Okay, so quickly email me your presentation. Um, in the essence of time, Anthony, I think we should just mm -hmm. move on maybe to the next speaker and then bring Karabu back after that. Right, I think that's fine. So if we move on to Batabile. Karab, would you switch off your camera and your microphone? Thank you. Okay, now we just, uh, we have asked Batabile to join us. Batabile, just okay. <laughs> remember to accept the notification on your screen. But I believe it doesn't have a great connection, Anthony, so I think that okay. might, be, might be an issue. Right. I remember we were battling earlier. There we go. Okay, but I believe if you don't mind, just keep your um, camera mic off. off. Okay. okay. Just fine. So we're going to skip ahead one to Batibile, who's going to talk about 
the distribution of the spread of Chinese elm. Um, Isra, if you can just share, uh, thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Watavile, and I'll be presenting the distribution and spread of Amas polyfolia in South Africa. Amas polyfolia, also known as Chinese elm or lacebark elm, is a deciduous tree with distinctive features such as a dark green leaves, some seeds, and an exfoliating bark. It is native to some southeastern countries of Asia, and it can withstand harsh environments such as various pH levels, droughts, and extreme heat. This species is recorded as a naturalized species in different habitats, including riparian habitats. Um, <clears throat> riparian habitats uh, extend from the river margin to the limits of the area, and they are also defined as a transition between aquatic systems and terrestrial ecosystems. Impacts of invasive species on riparian habitats include the displacement of indigenous species and display local dominance, which may result to changes in key ecosystems and lead to the vulnerability of other species. Therefore, the aim of the study is to investigate the distribution and spread of Almas parifolia in South Africa. Next slide, please. Okay, the materials and methods of the study include the records that were obtained from Sandy Herbaria as well as SAPIA databases and field trips were conducted to, uh, to survey the occurrence and distribution of the species. The results include the distribution and spread of the species in South Africa. Amas parvifolia, as you can see in the map, occurs in six of the nine provinces in South Africa. And this map shows also shows a 10 year series of the species which started to neutralize in the, la in the late 1970s. Next, please. The graph, no, before that. The graph shows the percentage occurrence of Almas parifolia in different habitats. For example, when looking at the comparison between the rivers, roads, and railways, the percentage difference is big. And this might be due to the planting of Chinese elm as an ornamental tree. Next slide, please. The map on the screen shows the distribution and spread of almas at, at Ferret Land Nature Reserve, which also happens to be a natural habitat. Next, please followed by a map which shows the spread of Almas parifolia at Bramfond Bain Spread and Delta Park. This depicts that the species population is very high in riparian habitat. Next, please. In conclusion, further studies, further research will be conducted not only to look at the, dis the distribution and spread of the species, but also to investigate the reproductive strategy and the impact of the species on urban riparian habitats. Thank you. Thanks for that, Patsibile. Are there any questions? I wonder maybe just for myself, Patsibile, did you also consult um, websites like iNaturalist to look at, at other possible occurrences? Um, yes, we did, because uh, I've been also looking at the other species of Amas, but yes, I have been looking at iNaturalist to just check, check where um, Amas parifolia occurs in South Africa. Okay, okay, great. Um, I don't see any other questions coming up, so I think maybe in the interest of time, let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks, Patibili. So we'll try again with Carabo, if possible. Carabo, are you around? I see my thinking of five minutes is totally impossible. We're already behind time.
Karabu, are you around? Karabu, just switched on your camera, on your microphone. Anthony, I haven't received yeah. Karabu's uh, presentation. Uh, no. um, um, let me you want to try again. share again quickly, Karabu? Let's see. Okay. Okay. Are you sharing it, Karabu? There's nothing happening on our side. Are There's they... nothing happening. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you we very much. Thanks, Karabu. Okay. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting on the seed biology and seed dispersers of an invasive rosaceae species in the eastern free state. South African grasslands are threatened by many different invasive woody plants, with most invasive species belonging to eucalyptus and the pine families, which then meant most of the attention in terms of research and management was focused on those trees. But members of the rosaceae species are becoming increasingly problematic, and because of the increased spread and abundance, Cotoniaster species are posing a major risk to ecosystem services and biodiversity, especially in KZN, Eastern Cape, and Eastern Free State. Uh, despite this, there's been very little research conducted that focuses on the drivers of Cotoniaster invasions and their impacts in our country. So the aim of this study was to explore the seed biology of Cotoniaster panosis, which is native in China, that is established in the mountain grasslands of the Eastern Free State. This was achieved by investigating the food availability, seed production, and seed dispersers. Results show that Cotoniaster panosis produces bright red fruits from April until mid-November and has large fruit displays, produces up to 6 million seeds per meter cube of a shrub. There's also a positive relationship between the size of the shrub and the seeds that the shrub will produce. Most fruits uh, fall under the canopy of the shrub, and as you move away from the shrub, the number of seeds in the soil decreases. So most of the fruits uh, therefore seeds fall under the shrub canopy and they are consumed as they fall and also directly from the trees. So the fruits are dispersed by various birds and mammals and birds that consume, consume the fruits directly from the shrub and they include cape white eyes, red-eyed bulbuls and speckled mouse birds. And mammals that consume fruits that have fallen under the canopy include um, your domesticated animals such as goats and cows as well as smaller wilder animals like mongoose and mice. Fruits are dispersed by birds and livestock which demonstrates that long distance dispersal is facilitated by indigenous birds and mammals. In conclusion, high seed abundance, extended fruit availability and efficient avian dispersals are traits that are associated with weediness, which then adds to the invasive potential of cotinia stapanosis. We hope that these findings will be useful in addressing infestations, especially if populations are small and are detected at an early stage of invasion. Thank you. Thank you, Karabu. Excellent talk. Um, are there any questions for Karabu? Sorry, let me just scroll down. Um, no, there aren't any questions. Thanks, Karabu. We may come back to you later down the line um, with some questions later on. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so if we move on to the next speaker, it's Patricia Masoli, who's going to be talking about Berberis. Hi, Patricia. Hi everyone, I will be presenting to you about the current status of invasive shrub berberis julia 9 in Golden Gate Highlands National Park. Berberis julia 9, commonly known as winter berberi, is an invasive alien species in South Africa originating from central China. A study implemented by Jan Hendrik Kitt and colleagues under the Sunbi 
Invasive Species Program in 2016 documented its presence in the Golden Gate Highlands National Park in the First State Province. In this study, they implemented various control measures in an attempt to manage the plant and its spread within the park. They then recommended a follow-up research should be done to check if their control measures were a success or not. This study aimed at comparing the current population number to that recorded by Kit et al. in 2014 to determine if the control measures were successful in preventing further spread of this invasive alien species in Tlenrinen Rest Camp in Golden Gate Highlands National Park. In order to do so, the localities of each mature shrub was noted using GPS and the number of seedlings in the sample quads approximately 10 by 10 meter of near regular intervals were recorded along the riverbanks of the Little Caledon River and its tributaries borders the Tlenrinen campsite and recreation area within the park. Our results show that Control measures that were put in place by Kidet all in 2016 worked well at eradicating most of the adult population of the various Juliani, as very few mature plants were recorded. However, some mature plants were observed and were reproducing. In, despite the, the total number of mature various Juliani shrubs being Reproduced statistical analysis showed that there was a significant increase in both number and density of seedlings during the six years following control measures, which total number increased from six to 588. In, in conclusion, if left unchecked, Checked, the population will continue to grow rapidly. Control measures should be taken immediately before the seedlings become sexually mature, especially since the seedlings are easily removable at this, at this stage. In addition, it is recommended that a remaining mature shrub shrubs should be controlled with the care that feather seeds are not dispersed within while cutting and treating the straps. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, are there any questions for Patricia? Maybe while we wait, Patricia, I'm interested, what is the distribution of these invasive species elsewhere in the country? Has it been recorded anywhere else? Do we only know it from Golden Gate? So know? far it has only been at Golden Gate. Okay. And how easily are the seedlings identifiable for control? I mean, is it fairly distinctive? Is it easy yes, for they, people to identify early on? Yes, they have uh, thorny leaves, which are easily distinct, dist distinguished. Okay, fantastic. Um, thank you. I don't see any other questions at the moment. Thank you so much, Patricia. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Jao Marcelo Silva. Hi, Jao. Do you want to go ahead? Yes, Welcome. Uh, I just need a little brief on how do I, uh, is my screen being shared? So we can see your camera. I think you need to open your presentation in full screen and then uh, share, if I recall. Okay. How do I share it? I'm so sorry. How do I share no? it? Hold on, let's see. Ansu might come in. Um, this is Angela. I'm coming to assist you. So if you've got it in full presentation mode, what you can then do is press the Windows key button with the letter D together to bring you back to your desktop. Right. Then you're going to come back to Remo where you'll see our faces. Yes. Okay. And then there's a share button at the bottom of your screen. Press the share button. Okay. And then you'll see a pop-up. I want you to select Window and your presentation should be lying there. All right. Uh, is it there? No. If you, if you see it there, just click on it and press share. I don't see it. 
it's window and it's empty. Okay. Can I, should I try again the procedure? Maybe just close the presentation one more time and try again. Okay, let me close From it. The beginning. Now let me open it. And then share it. Window. I see it now. Okay, good. Then okay. just press the share button. There we Perfect. Go. Just click Is on the there? site once to progress. All right. There Does we it... go. All it's right. Working. Thanks a lot. Thanks. I'll go Did ahead. I start? Yes, Thank go ahead. You. Hi, so a bird preys on a caterpillar which fed on the leaves of a plant grown in a substrate full of heavy metals. Is this bird under risk of contamination? Well, that's a very tricky question since many, many factors will influence the transfer of these metals from the soil to the plant, from the plant to the caterpillar, and finally from the caterpillar to the bird. However, me and my colleagues under the supervision of Prof. Stefan Siebert have been able to review at least some of the patterns regarding plant bioaccumulation of metals in South Africa. We have found that many plants, despite the species, accumulate metals in their leaves in a very close relationship to the metals available in their environment. This means that if the sediment of a given area is rich of heavy metals, there is a chance that these metals will also be present in the plant leaves. And although heavy metals can be toxic to many organisms, these plants seem to be suffering no harm at all. In fact, some of them accumulate these elements in concentrations considered toxic for most of other plant species. So far, our investigations have shown that plants with high concentrations of heavy metals were found especially in sites bearing mining activities. The residues from these activities, like the mining tailings and the particulate material in the air, are usually saturated with potentially toxic metals. We were also able to evidence health risks from these residues on the food plants grown in the home gardens around these mining sites and the results are quite scary. But not all is bad news. Through the identification of bioaccumulating plants from field sampling and from growth in controlled experiments, we have shown that South Africa has a species with high potential for uptake and storage of heavy metals in their tissues. They can therefore be used as phytoremediators of contaminated soils, promoting the rehabilitation of the soils in the mining areas. How they do that and how, what are the risks to the trophic chain consuming these plants are the next steps on our endeavor, as we are currently starting new projects on the ecophysiology of plants and the relationship with the metals in the substrate, as well as, well as with the herbivores consuming them. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that, Shao. Very interesting presentation. Are there any questions? So, Jean, maybe if you can just say some more about what, what you were you were saying about um, cultivated plants from people's gardens that yes. you find these heavy metals accumulated in in certain species, in particular certain crops. Yes, yeah, some some uh, some of the plant foods. Uh, some of the food plants grown in these areas, uh, they receive the, the particulate material that comes in the air from the mining activity in general, but also from the transportation, from the trucks, for example. All this dust with time, over time it accumulates and we found that uh, unwashed, that the practice of washing the, the leaves by itself, it's already very advantageous for, for the consumers. But if you consume those plants without washing, you good, you're going to be running serious risks. Right. Well, OK, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Any great job. So we may come back to you for more questions at the end of the session. It would be a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so we'll move on to our next speaker, which is Nomfusi Nsobi. Hi, can you hear me? I know, Pussy. Yes, we can hear you. Um, uh, Jean, um, sorry, Jean, I think you need to stop sharing your presentation. Oh, sorry, sorry. 
Great. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Then I need to share, I think, my screen. Okay. Application window. Okay, I'm trying to share, but it's not displaying on the screen here where I'm supposed to share. I guess it's loading at the background. Possibly not. Being okay. Wait, there we go. There we go. We can yes. see it. We can see it. Well done. Um, ahead, there's please. a pop-up screen in front of me. Should I cancel it? Because I can't see my presentation. Let me see. Here. Cancel it. Let's see what happens. Okay, no, so I think try again. Oh, okay. It was sharing a second ago. Okay, um, share again. Is it loading, do you think? No, yeah, it's, it's loading at the background. So I should... Wait, there we go. Maybe it's being, I'm not sure if it's being presented for you. There's definitely something shown on the screen. But can you see my presentation? So we can see a slide, which, yeah, we can see your front slide. So okay. um, we're going to yeah. drive your slides for you. Okay. So if you can just come back to Remo, where you can see Anthony and myself and your slides, and then you can just prompt Ezra to move on to the next slide when you're ready. Okay, so I should cancel this pop-up window. Yes. And, yeah, but I can see my slides now properly. Um, okay, so you'll just notify for changes because it's not projecting from your side. No, because it's protected, being projected from the help desk oh. screen. Oh, so okay. just say when you want to move to the next slide, if I understand correctly, Ezra. Okay, so is there someone on your other side that will project? Yes, so that's what we oh, see. Okay. So you, you can just say, say when we need to change slides, okay? All right. Um, okay. Thank Go you for, for thank you so much for the time. Um, I'm gonna give you a sh um, share a, a, a background and overview of this um, plant species. It is Marasmodus undulata, and it occurs in the Cape floristic region and is limited to one area in Nepal in the Western Cape, South Africa. Thus, this species is listed as critically endangered and um, funding was sourced as there was a dire need of conservation intervention to circumvent total extinction of this species in the wild. And um, the main objectives of this project were to, res are to restore and strengthen the population of Marismodus undulata and associated plants, improve the habitat of the site, support the municipality with um, effective site management and conservation, as well as to create awareness about conservation significance of the species and correlated um, habitat. Um, thank you for, so much for the slide. Um, the second slide um, entails about the propagation of this plant species, which um, was done through collection of seeds and the cuttings. And so the seeds were collected from the Millennium Seed Bank storage, which plays a significant role in, in storing seeds of varying plant species and helps in, in cases of um, decline in the number of population and, in, and even extinction. And these seeds were portioned between the Stellenbosch and Kissenbosch Botanical Garden and for the purpose of mass production of the species. And currently, seven of these um, survived 
survived germination and currently seven of those that survived germination are considered as original plants and they are genetically diverse due to being grown from seeds and used to bulk up the numbers of plant materials. Seed viability tests were done and smoke treatment was performed to encourage germination. And the second method was cuttings and currently our collection remains with 63 of the 87 original cuttings, even though there was a good rooting, rooting um, discovery, but um, the species growth have been, has been a learning curve. Um, this is due to the results of not having previous recorded experience in growing this um, genus place and it played a, a, a huge factor and, and yeah. And in continuation, um, the rooted cuttings were, were transplanted in deeper, in deeper trays to establish a strong rooting system before being transplanted into stock beds. And this was done to secure enough mature stock material available for bulking. The next slide, please. And the last slide um, emphasizes on the learned lessons throughout the progression of um, this um, um, species conservation. Um, the first lesson was uh, that most resourceful um, experimental facilities like tissue culture uh, are required, sorry for that, are required um, to trial more techniques like um, tissue culture, obviously, that of which have been, have proven potential in few plant genus propagation. And the second lesson was that seed germination and viability tests should be conducted in the absence of a previous horticultural knowledge and also development of growing conventions and standardized systems are crucial for distinctly banked threatened plant species, as well as engagement or engaging of partnerships is crucial to disseminate and foster information and experience of growing plants for reintroduction. And lastly, it is important to secure and ensure land, land owners and conservation agencies um, with the feedback and progress of the project. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Namfusi. Excellent presentation. Um, I'm interested in that, the, you know, I see you call the plants, what do you say, endangered? Yes. So I was just interested in that because as far as I know, is it not currently, would, you, would it not be currently considered extinct, I guess, in the wild? Yeah. Oh no, it is still um, critically endangered. And okay. due to the fact that we are uh, um, in a good progress of conservation of the plant status, it is well rehabilitated and restored in Orleans and Paul. Okay. I thought that population had been completely destroyed. So yeah. there are still individuals? Yeah, there are still individuals that we have restored okay. and, uh, and are still conserved in that only particular area. So hence it is still under um, critically endangered status. Oh, fantastic, that's great news. Okay, I see there is a question. There's a question asking, what method did you use to test for seed viability? Oh, um, during that process, uh, sorry, I was absent, but then this is the information of the ongoing processes. So hence I thought, let me just mention it so that we don't miss it. In the presentation right. okay and i just maybe another question from my side for these the testing on the cultivation are you only focusing on the species or does it make sense to use some of the other closely related species where maybe you have access oh, to no. material? oh no thank you for that question um we are not only focusing on that um maris modus only even though it is the focus species, but then we also um, propagating or cultivating the um, complementary species that would um, well adapt and establish in the um, re re rehabilitation and conservation area on site. Okay, okay, fantastic. I was just wondering if any of the other marismodes are maybe included in your study. Um, not really. This is the only focus. Yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Thank you so much. Great. Um, before we move on, I believe I just want to check before we move on to the next speaker. Is uh, CJ Roebuck, ST, 
or S. Ludic possibly present? As far as I can see, we haven't noticed you here. Sorry. In yeah. order for me to um, get out of this screen, should I switch off my camera? Yes, or if you turn escape? off your camera and your microphone. OK. Then you'll go back and great. Thanks, Mbuzi. Um, OK, so I think we, we're going to then skip those three lectures. I will move to P to P Ramalepi, um, who's going to be talking about Lipia Javanica. Hi, Philemon, how's it going? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Fine, thanks. Um, great. I'm, thanks for agreeing to jump a bit forward in the program. Do you want to try share your slide? Yes. Um... Just give me a few minutes to load in. Does it show? Uh, nothing yet. Is it showing okay. on your side? Um, not yet. Hi, Philemon. So Hello. If you've, got your, if you've got your presentation open in full slideshow mode, then you're going to press the Windows button and the letter D together to bring you back to your desktop. Then you need to come back to Chrome, where we are, where you can see our faces. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, no. Okay, stop sharing. Press stop share. You selected your entire screen, so just say stop oh, sharing. okay. And there's another window. So click the share button again now, and you'll see that there are three words displayed at the top. There's one that says window. I want you to select that. Oh, uh, yes, window. And then you'll see your presentation lying there. Do you see it? Um, no, it just says Remo. OK, and there isn't another one there. All right, let's try okay, this let one me, more. OK, let me, let me try again. Close your presentation completely, and then reopen it. Uh, I've made a few changes. So let me, let me try one last time, and then you can do it on your site if it fails again. OK. okay it's not it's not appearing okay um close it for me completely your presentation and reopen it i'm going to try one more time and then i'll talk to you from the beginning okay i've closed it okay open it afresh let me know when it's open it's open Okay, then I want you to um, open it up in full slide sh show mode so that it fills your entire screen. Yes. Then you're going to press the Windows button and the letter D together. Um, the little okay, window. I'm, I'm, okay, I'm using your Mac. The last time they said I should F, press, press F3. F3, correct. That'll bring you back to your desktop. Then you're going to come back to Remo. Okay. And then you're going to go to that share button, but instead of selecting entire screen, you're going to select window. Um, it doesn't appear. Okay. Um, okay. All right. okay can, I, can I quickly... 
Yes? Can I quickly email it to you? Sure, no problem. Um, I'll pop you a private message in the chat now. Perhaps, okay. um, Anthony, perhaps you want to move on to the next presenter so long while we sort out yeah, the presentation. Sure. Sure. So okay. we'll move on to Coletto. Is that right? Um, Coletto, are you here? Samiko? Coletto, we've just sent you a notification. If you can just accept and come up to the virtual stage. We'll send you the request again. Sumiko. Okay. Are we sending it now? If you see a little blue pop up on your screen, just click accept and then you'll appear on the stage. Okay. They, we're going to have to try and give her a call. Um, I don't know if you want to do a quick leg stretch break while we wait for the rest of our presenters. Yeah, we can. So should we break until how long should we go, Angela? Should we make maybe, it... maybe till 16.25. Yeah, that's fine. That I should agree. be sufficient time. Thank you so much. Okay, Angela. everyone. So we'll take a break till 16.25 for the last two presentations. Great, thanks Angela.